Crossroads Media. What is going on, everyone? A very painful loss for the 76ers. Before we talk about what happened today, if you're new to the channel, make sure you hit that subscribe button. We talk about Philadelphia sports every single day here. Also, smash that thumbs up button, too. It would mean the world to me. Also, on Twitter, at Broads81, I'm giving away a Mark Zumoff turning garbage into gold t-shirt. That's right. All you have to do is retweet the pinned tweet at the top of my profile and follow me as well. Every Wednesday, I select a winner and then I put up a new giveaway. So you are not going to want to miss out on the opportunity to win that. All right. Okay. Thank you all so much and enjoy the show. What is going on, everyone? Welcome on into Sports Talk with Broads. That was not a very good game of basketball, I'll tell you that for free. There's no way in hell I would have ever imagined in a million years the Atlanta Hawks shooting 36% from the field and 30% from three, and that being enough to take down the Sixers team, especially when the Sixers had a nice, solid stretch and a comfortable-looking lead in that second quarter, which they pissed away, basically. And weirdly enough, this is the strangest thing I'll ever say, but a lot of that had to do with the poor play by Joel Embiid. In what universe is that what we just witnessed? A lot of ill shots, tried to play hero ball. We always praise this team for being a unit, for being a five-man unit. Hell, more than a five-man unit, a ten-man unit. They utilize guys off the bench. They are a deeper team. They know their roles, and they cash in on their roles. And today, it just seemed like, get out of my way. I'm going to try and force up a bunch of shots when it wasn't necessarily the best looks. While in the second quarter, I thought the broadcast highlighted this perfectly, there were times where the Hawks were choosing to either allow Joel B to get the one-on-one -on -one matchup or to double team and pick your poison because they both didn't work. Joel on Clint Capella, one-on-one. -on -one, Fine, Joel Embiid ends up winning the battle, gets an easy two off of the glass. Or you want to double team Joel, fine. Great ball movement around the perimeter, ends up being a corner three. They score the bucket. Good luck. Good luck choosing what you want to do because whatever option you choose, the Sixers are going to find a way to make you pay regardless. But in the second half, it was the exact opposite. And it happened to a lot of guys. It wasn't just Joel Embiid. Ben Simmons was very poor offensively. Tobias Harris shut down a bit in that second half as well. Shake Milton had a nice couple of moments in that third quarter, fourth quarter mode. And Dwight Howard tried his best to create some energy with some slam dunks and some putback dunks and things of that nature. But ultimately, your top guys that we praised in Game 4 did not step up. And it's just so weird and bizarre to watch Joel play that way. The last time I remember seeing such a pathetic effort out of him was basically when he had zero points against Marcus Gasol. Now, we saw him go back to the locker room, and we all understand that there's clearly discomfort going on with the torn meniscus. He was all over the floor. What I have the problem with, though, was the body language. You could tell that he was out of sync, and you could tell that he was bothered and frustrated when he was mouthing to the fans, go fuck yourself or shut the fuck up or whatever words came out of his mouth. It was something along those lines. I just forget exactly what it was, but he was not happy. Some look at that as, wow, that's awesome. Wow, that's so cool. Wow, look at Joel Embiid. Oh, this is my MVP. I look at it as... Dude, you're not focused. You're not you're not properly engaged. You're worried about the wrong things. I look at that as a negative. I read that as poor body language. I look at that as mentally kind of getting beaten down a bit and you're just taking out your your pain and you're taking out your frustration on the wrong things. Do it on the floor. Get to where you need to get to and maybe if you are not getting the best looks, kick it out to your teammates. Trust your teammates. He had 8 assists in the previous game. He was not finding his teammates, not looking for his teammates like in other games. And I think that really costed the 76ers. I thought Ben Simmons costed the Sixers as well. Look, I know that I get uh, I get very intense with the Ben Simmons drama, right? Shake Milton was carrying the ball up with the last possession. And Ben Simmons got benched. Why? Because he's one of five from the free throw line. And because he can't shoot a basketball. So in a playoff game... 
on the road when the series is 2-1. to one. And I'm not telling you that this is exactly the difference, but you had to basically rely on. And Seth Curry was great all game long. He finished with 17 points, and he basically bailed you out of a lot of brutal possessions in that first half, I thought. Him and Tobias Harris did, basically. But I'm not telling you this was exactly the difference. I do, though, look at the back end of a game. When you're thinking of the last possession on the road, 3-1 or 2-2 heading back to Philadelphia, and your $30 million man is getting benched for a role player who, who pretty much sucked for the last three months, that's what you need to put out there as your primary ball handler because Ben Simmons can't shoot the rock. That doesn't, that doesn't eat you alive. You don't see that. And then after the game, I have to hear him say, I probably should have been more aggressive. Ben, no shit, dude. No shit. And I got on him because in game four, when he did go in the post and the Sixers relied on him being that spark plug out in the second half to start things off and he changed the game, Doc Rivers and Joel Embiid had to tell him, Ben, we need you. Ben, you got to be more explosive. Ben, you got to attack the rim. And then after the game today, he goes, yeah, I probably should have been more aggressive. Why don't you know that? Why does someone have to tell you that? Then he talks about the spacing not being there. I wonder why that is. It's it's one, because you can't shoot a basketball. Two, Danny Green not being available hurts the team. You did throw Matisse Thibault out there. He started with Furkan Korkmaz. There's so many layers to this, right? Furkan Korkmaz destroyed you defensively. I don't care about the one late three that he made. Furkan Korkmaz was a problem. He lacked defensive awareness. He was all over the place, missing assignments left and right. He was a disaster on the defensive side of the floor. So when you do have Matisse Thibault in there, who we know lacks offensive play, the Atlanta Hawks did not give him one second of respect, and he shot two of seven from the field. Now, there was one moment that I loved out of Matisse Thibel, and it was a great hustle play defensively. Picked it from Trey Young on the defensive. It was in transition. He gets back in transition, steals the ball, hits a three on the other end. I thought that would be such a big moment for the Sixers in that later half, but Trey Young responded with the three of his own basically within a second or two, and it made it null and void and made it a wash. But, yeah, I mean, look, the Ben Simmons thing, it just it eats me alive because I watched people get upset with Shake Milton. Why did Shake Milton throw it to Seth Curry when he was swarmed and this and that? Well, why are we putting Ben Simmons on the bench? And it was the right move. But seriously, I mean, think about this. Think about what we're talking about. And then tell me that I overreact to Ben Simmons. I don't overreact. I keep it how it is. I keep it 100. And more on Ben, by the way. When Ben Simmons has 11 or more shot attempts in a playoff game, the Sixers are 11-3. and three. When Ben Simmons has 10 or less attempts in a playoff game, the Sixers are 6-9. and nine. Just to put it in perspective on how important he is to the success of the Sixers with more than just defense. With more than just his defense, his offensive game matters as well. That side of the game is very important. Now, ultimately, you know, when you analyze this game, Joel Embiid is going to be the storyline. He was probably the biggest problem in this entire game because he was so dysfunctional. He was so out there. I mean, it was bonkers. I feel almost like I'm living in a different universe right now, like... What what are, what did we just watch? In what world did Joel Embiid look that inefficient? Just jacking up nonsense. I couldn't believe some of the takes that he had. I also, though, saw him take the mid-range dumpers that he makes 99 out of 100 times. I don't anticipate this being the Joel Embiid that we are going to see long-term. Unless, unless... The injury was a huge reason why that's what went down. Now, I don't know if it is or not. Clearly, he's going to be playing through pain, and it's not going to be easy to fight through a torn meniscus. But I also thought that, to a degree, it was one of those nights where 
You just did not have it. And if you play that game and take some of those same shots in another game, I'm not saying all the shots, definitely not all of the shots. But if you take some of those same shots in another game, let's say on Wednesday, they do fall. And it was just one of those really weird, bizarre nights for Joel. And there's a reason why we are so stunned and in awe because, well, this isn't normal. This is very strange. Now, I brought up that Wednesday is their next game. They've had days off. They've had weird amount of times in between these games. Now that we're seeing Joel play through this physical toll, uh, toll I was going to say playing through some, you know, he's, he's battling and we're seeing his tolerance, but he's playing through this toll on his body. Well, you have less time to relax and get your body right. It's more, hey, you're into the thick of things here. Into the thick of it. I did not just do that, really. Am I a TikTok guy? Did I seriously just do that? Shame on me. That's a joke. That's pathetic. I'm sick. I'm disgusted with myself. Just like I'm a little bit disgusted with Joel Embiid, Ben Simmons, Tobias Harris, and this team to allow the Atlanta Hawks to tie this bad boy up. I'm not worried long-term for this series. I do see the reaction of, oh, no, the Hawks are going to do this. Really? You, you, you said the same thing after game one. I told you, you'd sweat this out. This Hawks team is gritty. All right? This Hawks team's going to make you a little bit more uncomfortable than you would like it to be. I think the Sixers win game five, and I think the Sixers win game six. And I think this is a four to two series where the Sixers win. But Danny Green is a big loss. Danny Green brings you the spacing on the floor offensively. And I know he hasn't been very well defensively, but I, I think that there's an element there where with Matisse Thibel and with Korkmaz, you have to pick your poison. I guess that's kind of our theme here with some of the some of the explanations that happened throughout this game. You need to pick your poison with Matisse. Okay, he brings you electric defense, but he has a problem shooting the, the rock. And with Furkan, he'll shoot the rock as much as you want him to. Trust me, you don't have to beg him to let it fly. At the same time, my man gets abused. Herder had a move on him that just left him out of his shoes. It spun around him perfectly in an easy bucket where basically Furkan Korkmaz was left in the dust. With Danny Green, I'm not telling you that he was perfect defensively because he wasn't. But more times than not, I've seen Danny Green hold his own and he gives you the best of both worlds. And everyone thought that, well, he's been so poor defensively that it's not going to be that much of a loss. No, it is. It is going to be that much of a loss. And that definitely impacts your bench as well because now you got to throw some of these guys into your starting rotation. In terms of starting, Mati or excuse me, in, in terms of starting... Furkan Korkmaz. I thought that that was fine. I'm okay with starting Furkan. It was more about knowing when to pull the trigger on him and, and keep the leash short. If the leash was too long, then I think it could be the downfall. And uh, while I thought Furkan was weak tonight and I did not like what he brought to you on the defensive side of the floor, I got to look at the top guns more so as the issues. And, you know, for as much as we praised them for game four, they were the big reason to your downfall in game five. And it's just so crazy to think that they really let this one slip. You know, I thought that they showed a lot of dysfunction when majority of the time this season, we've seen them be a cohesive group that knew how to come together and knew how to face adversity. And it was super close down the stretch. You know, I thought the Sixers escaped because Trey Young had Furkan Korkmaz one-on-one -on -one in isolation. This was prior to Joel Embiid missing that layup, which I'm drawing up that play every single damn time for Joel Embiid. If you tell me you get Joel Embiid a half a centimeter away from a layup position, and that's what we live and die with at the end of a playoff game on the road, even if it's at home, it doesn't matter. At the end of a playoff game, if I get Joel Embiid a half an inch away from the, from the basket, I'm taking that every single day of the week. That's why I chalk it back up to something just seemed like look yes the knee's bothering him and yes I'm sure there's a correlation I've also seen him drop 40 with this knee I've seen him drop 39 with this knee and yes there's going to be wear and tear and that's why that there has been a bit of me that's been a little nervous because I know the more and more you play on it the more miles you put on the tire eventually that things possibly could go wrong for the worse and I never really want to think that brutal about it but 
we got to be realistic to some degree. We can't just pretend that that's not a part of this at all. But going back to the possession for the Hawks before that, Trey Young had Furkan Korkmaz in isolation. And good thing for Tobias Harris to bring really good help defense, which forced the Atlanta Hawks to, to pass the basketball around. And it ended up being a, a really tough spot for the Hawks where they did not get the look that they were looking for. But if you think about this, man, if you're Trey Young, I'm licking my chops seeing Furkan Korkmaz on the other side of me. But Tobias Harris, thankfully, stepped up and, and definitely helped out there because he recognized this can't happen. We're going to be screwed if this happens. And speaking of Trey Young, he was bitching and complaining all night long. But I, I will admit that you know, he did make some plays towards the end. He did have a lot of assist numbers, and he took a lot of field goals for his points. So I'm not going to sit here and praise all of his field goal attempts, but he's he's playing hurt. You see his right shoulder. He made some plays, and yeah, there's basically that. There has been a lot of noise about the rebounds because after the first quarter, uh, wow, Ben Simmons, eight rebounds. He averages seven points something. He's already got eight. And wow, Joel Embiid, 19 rebounds. <laughs> rebounds are important at the same time they could be overvalued why did Ben Simmons have eight rebounds after the first quarter I'll tell you why because the Atlanta Hawks were jacking up garbage because they couldn't make easy layups because they were missing the most easiest looks in the entire world so there were so many rebounds to grab some rebounds hold high value other rebounds don't and I'm not going to tell you that all that, like, yeah, Joel had 19 rebounds. He, he also was terrible tonight. So I'm not going to praise 19 rebounds. Ben Simmons in the first quarter grabbing eight rebounds. I chalked that up more to what the, what the hell was going on with the Atlanta Hawks missing buckets the way that they were, the, the type of stuff that they were just throwing up there. I think that that just gets blown out of proportion, in, in my opinion, uh, to some degree. But now that I think about that, you know, just to put it in perspective, if we go to the stat line and we look at what Ben Simmons finished with with rebounds for the ones that do care about it a lot more than I do to a degree, he finished with 12. So just to think about what he did have after the first quarter and what he finished with, you know, just saying, just looking at it with, with those eyes. Yeah, I'm bothered though. You know, I'm, I'm definitely bothered and I'm upset that that's what we that's what we witnessed. I did not like the body language. It upset me a lot. Before we continue this conversation, as you could imagine, the Anytime Hotline is going crazy. DraftKings Sportsbook is not only my favorite sportsbook, but also America's top-rated sportsbook. I love using DraftKings Sportsbook. It is easy to navigate. It has plenty of instructions for new bettors and nearly limitless ways to get in on all the action. My friends and family have been loving DraftKings, and I know you will too. Listen to this great offer. Download the top-rated DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use promo code BROGE when you sign up to turn $1 into $100 in free credits. Bet on the basketball team of your choice to win their next game, and if they do, you will claim $100 in free credits. That's promo code BROGE for a limited time, only at DraftKings Sportsbook. Must be 21 or older, Pennsylvania only, new customers only, wager paid out in site credits. Restrictions apply in partnership with Meadows Racetrack and, and Casino. See DraftKings.com slash Sportsbook for details. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Non-team game. That, that's the way I kind of analyze this, you know? They did not play a team game. And if you want to play as individuals, you're basically going to get this. Now, there were moments and there were spurts where I thought that they did play a good team game. And that's when you had a good brand of basketball. And there were times where you still scored points because you got bowed out by a Seth Curry jumper. Seth Curry getting his. And real quickly on Seth Curry, uh, I was listening to NBA radio on Sirius XM. And they were talking about this Luka Doncic thing and how... Maybe they, and I don't want to get too sidetracked here, but it relates to Seth Curry and how Luka Doncic doesn't think that Mark Cuban and the and the Dallas Mavericks can set him up for success and pretty much build a contender around him. And there's analytical guys that are pretty much making decisions, and that kind of relates to what I was trying to tell everybody about Brett Brown era towards the end there and what was happening with Joshua Harris and how there were so much analytics trying to force the rotation and tell the coach what to do with the rotation, and that's what was happening with the Sixers at the back end before they made the whole front office change and all that, but that's not really the point here. 
what was brought up was how could you possibly move Seth Curry for Josh Richardson? It was just a disgraceful move by the Dallas Mavericks, and it's just so pitiful. Never in today's era of basketball should you move on from shooting. You only trade for shooting. You don't trade your shooters. You only trade for acquiring the shooters. And when you look at Seth Curry and what he's been doing for you and how he performed today, it's just so damn electric to have that type of guy on your team. It's magnificent. And one of the things that was mentioned was, and yes, I'm going to take a shot at Ben Simmons here, but it was, why in the world would you trade for defense over a shooter? Because in today's era of basketball, shooting means way more than defense does. And that doesn't downplay what Ben Simmons provides because there is an element of Ben Simmons is 50,000 times a better defender than Josh Richardson is. But just looking at that in general, just listening to that that conversation and those words come out of uh, the host's mouth, it's like, huh, you know, there is a point to that. And then I watch Ben Simmons have to be benched because he can't shoot the basketball and he can't make his free throws and hack a Ben could have been in play. And Doc Rivers told us that we know nothing about basketball. And I will continue to harp on that because no, 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 Doc Rivers, that's not true. We are smart basketball fans. We do understand the game of basketball. That's why we questioned you about it when it did cost this team earlier in the playoffs against the Washington Wizards, and we knew it could come back to bite you, and the fact that Shake Milton had to run your offense late in the playoff game on the road, and he had to settle for that shot by Seth Curry, is a major problem with Ben Simmons and a monster flaw, and it does matter. But I'm not saying it was only Ben. It definitely was not only Ben. He was a big part of it, and it irks me that he needs to be told to be more aggressive. There's no reason for that to be the case. I hate that he doesn't look at the basket ever, and he's unwilling to be that guy at times, especially when Joel is not on his game. He needs, as the floor general, he needs to be aware of that and say, fine, it's on me. Fine, I'll do what I did in the second half of the last game because I changed the outcome of the game. I made this spiral into control for us. I will do it again, but he wasn't. And, you know, Tobias, problem tonight. Joel, problem tonight. Ben Simmons, problem tonight. It's not only Ben, but what Ben does wrong was on full display tonight. And if you're unwilling to see that, well, then shame on you. All right, let's go to the Anytime Hotline. Here we go. I'm going to blame this loss on Doc Rivers. I don't know what Doc Rivers is thinking sometimes. Like, he put, like, basically a whole bench out there, maybe have, like, Tobias out there with them. And then, like, when he brings Joel back in, Joel's not hitting shots. He just keeps giving Joel the ball and making plays for him. And Doc needs to get Seth, um, Seth Curry involved, Tobias involved. Like, Seth was going was kind of hot and earlier. Get Ben more involved. Like, this, this, this was a loss that the Sixers shouldn't have had. I don't disagree that they should not have lost. I don't know if... And uh, look, Doc Rivers has a role in this loss. I put it more on the players, though. Going to Joel Embiid, who's been an MVP for you all year long and has never looked this much of a disaster in a long period of time, I don't have a problem for running plays for Joel. If you think specifically that last play is an issue to go to your big man where he's a half a centimeter away from the basket late in the game, like that's not a bad draw up. It's just bad execution and you could not finish the job, but it wasn't a bad look. It wasn't a bad play design. Could he have gotten – look, look. I think the problem was not so much not getting other guys going. It was the unwilling to do it. So playing hero ball, trying to do it yourself, it's more on the player at that point more so than it is Doc Rivers. Joel trying to force all those shots, he's got to realize to you – and he did that. I talked about the 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 broadcast highlighted it. When pressure was on Joel earlier in the game, he was totally okay with passing it around the perimeter until they got a wide open look. Later on in the game, that wasn't happening, but it's not as if they couldn't have done it. It's not as if that maybe they could have passed it to a three-point shooter. I, I saw Furkan Korkmaz wide open who did not get the basketball. I saw guys open, and it would be an ill of eyes shot. So, you know, uh, like Doc Rivers, I'm— I don't look at it as Doc Rivers. I look at it more as the other 
people, the players on the floor. I look at it as the players on the floor. I look at Ben Simmons. I look at Tobias Harris. I look at Joel Embiid. I look at the individuals on the floor who played a selfish brand of basketball and selfish in their own ways because Ben not willing to attack, selfish because you know you have holes in your game and you're, la- you're allowing that to hold you back. You don't want to attack the rim because you know you suck at free throw shooting. Well, something's got to give, dude. Something's got to give. You got to start making your free throws. You're allowing the other team to win. They're getting what they want. You not being aggressive is what the other team wants. At the same time, they probably want you to shoot as well because they know you're not good in that area and you lack that touch. So (laughs) there's something that has to be done here. You have to change, you have to adapt, you have to learn, you have to grow. But you got to do something because this isn't good enough. Joel is being very selfish because he's just jacking up a bunch of shots. Tobias Harris being selfish by not demanding the ball more and taking control. All of it. I look at it more so player than I do coach. But that doesn't mean the coach doesn't have a hand in this mix. When you talk about the all-bench thing and Tobias, all-bench and Tobias... When you don't have Danny Green, it only makes it harder. And with Joel going back to the locker room and having that for a little bit of time. And when he did return, he actually ended up cashing in a three out by that corner spot. So not the corner, it was more of the elbow spot there on that right side of the floor. But Tobias and Bench, I don't really have a problem with it, especially when you don't have Danny Green. It only makes it a lot harder because you're... Yeah, bench players. I mean, that's what you have. You already have a bench player in your starting rotation. So I just don't know what else to really expect in that area at that point. Very disappointing loss. Like, how did we lose that game? That's such an important game for us. To, we were going to finish that at home if we won that, but we didn't. And Embiid was settling for jumpers early and then couldn't get anything to go. Looked sloppy. He looked hurt for the first time. And... Ben Simmons was non-existent in the second half. Like, what are you doing? Stop picking up the dribble right when you cross half court. Do something. Shake Milton probably should have took that shot, but it, it shouldn't have come down to that. We had control of the game. We should have finished it out, and we couldn't. And I, I think the same thing with the Shake Milton thing. He probably should have taken that shot. But then I, I, I think that that's too... Looking at that for the... Just the the Shake Milton factor of, wow, I can't believe Shake Milton passed that up. There's so many problems with that when you start pulling back the layers. And it comes back to Ben Simmons. You're right. The frustration that you showed towards Ben Simmons is the right one. We should never be in the position where we need to rely on Shake Milton. And that's what I was saying when Shake Milton exploded in game two. Yeah, that's awesome that Shake Milton ended up becoming a, a hero for you. And when Furkan Korkmaz scores you 11 points in that game, what was that? Was that game four? The last game where it was 61-56, it was a five-point game at halftime, and Ben Simmons exploded in the third quarter because Furkan had 11 points in the first half, and he went on a ride. If he did not have those 11 points, it would have been definitely different. I don't like relying on Furkan and Shake to be the guys. I want to rely on Ben Simmons. I want to rely on the guy that I pay $30 million to run my offense. Do you see what Chris Paul does for his team in the fourth quarter? He's sensational. Okay, he doesn't... He's got way more of a three-point game than Ben Simmons does, but the whole drama surrounding that is the two-point game and how he's taking mid-range shots and how in the analytical world that that's not really a, a shot that's supposed to be taken a lot of the time, and that causes a lot of debate. Primary point guard, running your offense, Phoenix Suns, fourth quarter. Primary ball handler, Philadelphia 76ers, fourth quarter, benched. Come on now. Come on now. It's a joke. It's a flat-out joke that that's where we are. So even when I saw Ben Simmons underneath the basket and he passed up, and this was for Furkan's deep three late in the fourth quarter. Nice that he made the shot. I don't want to rely on a 60-foot Furkan Korkmaz three late in games. And it ended up, he ended up making it. And ultimately, it didn't really matter anyway because the Sixers lost the game regardless. But 
I don't want to be relying on Shake and Furkan. I just, I don't want to be doing that. I want to be relying on the superstar talent that you have. And with Ben, it, it's it's just irritating. It really is. And I don't want to hear, well, you wouldn't be having this conversation if Joel and B didn't have such a poor performance. It, it, it's a lot deeper than that. It's a lot deeper than that. If you think that that's just going to wash the Ben Simmons problems, well, then once again, very unfortunate for you. And Bede had the worst game that I've seen him have in a long time. And we still came within a shot of beating Atlanta. But this isn't about Atlanta. It's about the the upcoming series because we all know damn well that they're not winning the series. You know, you want to see him take a 3-1 lead, but you go, you're going back home. I'm not worried about this series, but and being those damn well that he can't play this bad against a Milwaukee or Brooklyn and expect to come out on top. And you just got to realize that Ben Simmons and free throws, you know, and just you, you got to maintain that big lead that you build up and maintain that momentum. Can't let freaking John Collins. Yeah, John Collins went off in that third quarter. He was explosive. Bogdanovich jacked up some shots for you and, and had some buckets as well. Yeah, John Collins actually put on a nice display there at times. He had the the place rocking. The Atlanta Fal the the I almost said the Atlanta Falcons. The Atlanta fans got pretty wild in there. It was uh, it was pretty intense in that third quarter, and I think the the Sixers let an opportunity slip for sure. I feel the same way you do. I just don't know if today's the day to, or at least right now. I mean, the game ended literally a half hour ago or so. So I just don't know if I'm in the mindset to go full board of this doesn't matter. It, it's a painful loss. I mean, I already did touch on it. I think the, the Sixers win game five at home. I think they win game six on the road. And I'm not surprised that this is more of a gritty series where you had to grind it out a little bit. But I just don't know if right now I could be in, in that same exact mode as the caller was there. Because, you know, there's a lot to dissect here that just in general, when you think of the longevity of this team, things that can play a role that, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know. I just, I'm baffled by that Joel Embiid display. I never thought in a billion years we'd see it. And it's funny, I, I was actually thinking about Joel Embiid tweeting out after some of his shots made in the first half. And, it, I mean, it wasn't all gorgeous by any means, but there was some nice buckets. And I was just thinking, damn, Joel Embiid is the best player on this planet. And I almost tweeted that out. Good thing I didn't because I would have got crucified for that 0 for 12 from the field stretch that he had. I probably would have got destroyed. So sometimes it's better to just not hit that send button. Yo, what's up, bro? It's uh, 76 is for life. Win or lose, I'm 76 is for life. Oh, boy, this loss tonight, you know, I'm not going to overreact. Uh, I still think that we're going to win the series with no problem. Um, we got home court advantage back, but, you know, we had the game, we had the game tonight. Uh, this loss, in my opinion, it wasn't about Joel missing a layup in the end. It was mostly on us as a team. Uh, we had several key possessions. In the fourth quarter that we turned the ball over and uh, didn't get off good shots, which I think will be corrected once uh, we get back to Philadelphia. Uh, this loss could have been prevented. As we could have been up 3-1, but we're going back to Philly, up tied 2-2. It's a two out of three series now, and uh, I think we're going to win. I think we have no problem winning the series. Uh, I agree with you. Now, one thing that you touched on, the Sixers turning the ball over at times, and yeah, whether it hit off Ben Simmons and went out of bounds or whatever the case was. The Atlanta Hawks only had four turnovers. Four turnovers. And we talk about how great this team is defensively. And the Sixers are a great defensive team. There's a reason why Ben Simmons is on the first defensive team. Joel and Matisse Thibel are on the second defensive team, which is crazy, by the way, with Matisse Thibel considering how many minutes he plays. It's very rare to see that amount of minutes get you onto, you know, that type of, of respect, right? It's crazy. It's absurd. So we know this team is phenomenal on that end of the floor. But four turnovers, I mean, you would think that getting in their face, uh, you could take advantage of how great you are defensively. You would turn the rock over. You'd get some transition points. You'd score off of turnovers. You'd get some corner threes. You'd, you'd push the pace. Well, that wasn't really the case. Four turnovers is bad. That's brutal. Now, can you look at it this way? How many games do you think the Hawks win when they shoot 36% from the field 
and 30% from three. Because I can make the argument, not many. It's sort of like how we address game one. How many times can you imagine the Hawks shooting 23s? Or, no, not shooting 23s, making 23s. You can't rely on that heavily. It's just not going to be reality of the situation. It's not going to happen a lot of the times. So, with that said, can you apply that same logic with the Hawks shooting the way that they did tonight? And also, while we're talking about how banged up Joel Embiid is, Trey Young has that shoulder, and you can see it looks red as can be. He's got the tape on it. Then when he's sitting on the bench, he's got this monster wrap on it where he looks like a cyborg, and he looks like a, a pitcher who's ready to go. <laughs> I saw actually a pretty damn funny tweet. It just was a random stat line. It was like seven and two-thirds innings pitched, three hits, zero earned runs, three walks, and eight strikeouts. And it was him sitting on the bench with the wrap on his shoulder. I thought that was pretty damn funny. But who knows what he's going to be like. You know, you saw him early on. He was jacking up some shots that were missed pretty brutally, and he thought maybe there was a correlation. Then he ended up getting into rhythm and making a couple shots. And, you know, his efficiency wasn't there, but he did have some nice assists as well. He had a nice assist total, and he did make some bigger shots as the game went on, and he did hit from distance as things kind of went uh, back and forth there late. But, yeah, I'm just I'm thinking of how is he going to feel, his shortness. We talk about Joel Embiid's. Well, Trey Young is, is a big part to their team, and if he's feeling banged up and he's nursing something and you're going on the road to play in a hostile environment in, in Philadelphia, you know, how much is that going to impact the way that the Atlanta Hawks play when we talk about Wednesday's game. All right, let's take one more call here. Broods. Hey, Broods. I just want to say, where are the real playoffs again? Where are the real playoffs? I remember you saying the real playoffs don't start until you beat the Hawks. Keep sleeping, bro. Keep sleeping. Keep sleeping on us. Okay, come on now, guy. Really? You watch this series and you truly believe the Atlanta Hawks are a better team? I've been giving the Atlanta Hawks respect. They're a nice, fun, exciting, young team. They are. They're not ready to win against the number one seed in the Eastern Conference. I don't think that they are good enough to take down the 76ers. And if they do, it's because of an epic collapse of the Sixers. I don't think that's going to happen, though. I don't think in a seven-game series, you're going to see an epic 76ers collapse. So, with all due respect, come on now. No one said it was going to be a sweep. There's a reason why you're in the second round. Fun team. You're not in the in the in the spot right now, though, to start pounding your fist and start pounding your chest. Right now, it's a three-game series. Right? Basically, three-game series. Two of those are in Philadelphia. You snagged one on the road. You don't win many games in Philadelphia if you're an opponent. It's just statistics. It's just facts. I won't be pounding my chest, all right? I'm not sleeping on anyone. I said in the beginning of this thing, with Joel Embiid being injured and with the torn meniscus and all that, I thought it would be closer to a six-game series. And that's basically how this is playing out. I didn't say it was going to be the biggest cakewalk in the world. We'd be sweating. Not uncontrollably. Just a little uncomfortable sweat. And that's pretty much what we're witnessing. No surprise by me. So, that's where we're at. And it's playing out the way I thought it would. So with that being said, I want to thank you all so much for listening to this episode of Sports Talk with Broads. Thank you so much, and I will see you next time.